Welcome to episode five of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lapore. I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and watching us on YouTube as well. If you're a new listener or viewer, we would really appreciate it if you subscribe to the show. That would be fantastic. So last week I said it was a great time to be a Leaf fan. And guess what? One week later, it is still a great time to be a Leaf fan because just like last week, as of Sunday morning, February 7th, 2021, Super Bowl Sunday, the Toronto Maple Leafs are in first place in the NHL standings with 19 points. They lead the Canadian division. They're one point ahead of the Montreal Canadiens. So things are are looking pretty good right now in Leaf land. And we will go over the week that was for this team and give you our thoughts and opinions on everything that went down with the Leafs. But first, it is time to welcome in Michael Lepore to the show. Thank you for having me, Anthony Bruno. It's uh, it's good to be here. I think you're wrong, though. You said it's still good to be a Leaf fan. I think it's even better to be a Leaf fan. We were uh, we were excited last week. Now this team pulled off some big wins, and now Leafs fans all over Canada are just tingling, tingling, walking, uh, walking with a little strut on Super Bowl Sunday. Across the uh, the land of the blue and white, man. You just you just love to see it. And Lapore, another thing you love to see is that you mm. have a new haircut. I have a new haircut. Uh, I lost some weight for those of you uh, watching on YouTube. Uh, pandemic time, yeah. Locked myself in the bathroom with the wife. She uh, took the clippers to it. It was like a bomb of hair exploded everywhere. Worst part was trying to clean it up. One of those things, though, man. We live in a different world, so. I mean, that's, that's today's haircut. I'll ask you though, of all the small little things that we're like missing out on or not able to do, what, what do you like the biggest or the most odd to you that you can't do? Kind of like something simple. Oh man, that's a really good question. Just like, even just going to like visit family. You have and to like, think about it. <laughs> if, you, if you go, like you have to, you, you have to put your mask on, you can't go inside. You have to like, just say hi to people like from their front porch, essentially like just those little things that you take for granted. Yeah. And and I'm not going to lie, Laporte, I would do some pretty crazy things right now for an actual haircut. Oh my God. And and I know that's a little thing, right? Little thing. It just feels good. Like something like that. Just, uh, and we're missing out on it right now. And, and I know it might seem for those watching us on YouTube that my hair actually looks uh, decent, but this is not, how Anthony Bruno likes his hair. <laughs> I, I'm I'm a hair diva. This 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 has to get cut immediately, yeah. Lapore. I yeah. can't wait to chop this thing off. But uh, enough of that, Lapore. Let's get into the Toronto Maple Leafs now. It was a great week. They yeah. absolutely dummied the Vancouver Canucks. Crazy. Just to go over the week that was. So the Leafs had four days off, and they returned on Thursday to play their first of three straight games against the Vancouver Canucks. And um, I mean, it was great. I mean, there's, there's really nothing else to say. The Leafs uh, came in, beat the Canucks 7-3. The Canucks were playing their third game in four nights. Uh, it was their third straight loss. So they were a little bit tired. And the big story of the game was Jason Spezza. He was incredible. His eighth career hat trick, turning back the clock, looking like 2007 Jason Spezza from the Ottawa Senators. Austin Matthews, Continued his amazing play. He scored a couple of goals. Uh, Wayne Simmons contributing as well. And we saw him drill Quinn Hughes at the end of the game and then fought Jordy Ben. So that was good to see if you're a Leaf fan. And yeah, it was just an all-around dominant performance. Leafs outshot the Canucks 37-19. It was was one of those dominant wins that that we have been waiting for with this team. That's right. Yeah. And then the Leafs played the Canucks again on Saturday night. And once again, just destroyed them. 5-1 Leafs. Matthews, another two goals. Wayne Simmons scored a couple of goals. My favorite player in NHL history, for those who have watched this podcast, Miko Lennon, <laughs> had a couple of assists. Um, and it's been it's been a really rough time for the Canucks recently. They have now yeah. been outscored 23-9 to in four Oof. straight losses to the Leafs and Habs. So it's been a disaster for that team. But the Leafs have... Have looked great in Lapore. Now I'll throw it back to you. I mean, what what are your impressions of, of how the Leafs played this past week? 
Yeah, I mean, I was a little nervous going into the two games because it was a team the Leafs hadn't seen before, and it was a team that kind of had that label that the Leafs should beat up on them. But they had that football score of a game in the first one, winning 7-3. And then again, you get nervous for the second game because you're afraid they're going to take their foot off the gas. And no, like they dominated. I saw James Myrtle posted, it was 10 minutes in, the Leafs had a 98% expected goals rate. And he even said himself, he's like, I don't even think I've ever seen that before. Like after over a span of like an opening 10 minutes of a game. But as we mentioned previously, I mean, the last, the previous two weeks for the Maple Leafs have been really good, but you and I both agreed that what was missing was that type of explosion of offense, the type of team we expect to see with the talent on the roster, where they just go out there and destroy an opponent. And they sure as hell kick the shit out of the Canucks. Now, whether that's because the Leafs are really good or because the Canucks are really bad, a combination of both. You mentioned the Canucks uh, had played the third game in four nights, was it? I think I heard, too, that they've played the most games in the NHL, I believe, too. So Mm -hmm. it's a combination of all things. But at the end of the day, to me as a Leafs fan, it doesn't really matter. Because even people are pointing to the Leafs wins, like, oh, they're beating up or they're getting wins on bad uh, against bad teams. They beat up on the Canucks. For people who have been Leafs fans for a long time, know they we know that this is not a normality for the Toronto Maple Leafs. We've been a team, even in these last few years of being a solid NHL team, we've been a team that has had a hard time against bad teams, or we leave it interesting, or we fall behind, we get scored on early. What they showed against the Canucks, again, is what we've been aching for and hoping for for a long time. And we had some fears at the beginning of the season that maybe we, were, we weren't going to get that out of this team. But I think the Leafs stars came out. I think their depth came out. I thought Freddie looked pretty good in both games. So again, man, Super Bowl Sunday and Maple Leafs fans everywhere are walking with a strut. What was your uh, take on those two games? Yeah, I mean, I loved that the Leafs finally, for essentially the first time this season, just really laid the hammer down and just beat up on a team because there have been some moments throughout this season, you know, despite how great their record is and despite them being in first place in the standings early on in the season, there were games that I thought the Leafs dominated Mm -hmm. and it didn't just, it didn't show up on the score sheet. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wanted to see them beat a team by three, four, five goals, you know, and I wanted to see, you know, the advanced metrics and all the expected goals and look, oh, the Leafs have these great possession numbers. I wanted to actually see that translate to a big number on the scoreboard. And we finally saw that in these Canucks games where honestly, it just looked like the Canucks were totally outclassed in every facet of the game. Yeah. Like offensively, the Leafs were doing whatever they wanted, whereas the Canucks really had a very difficult time generating anything offensively. And then on the defensive side of things, the Canucks, they look like an absolute mess. Their goaltending isn't great right now. And and coming into the season, you know, I was a little bit worried about the Canucks goaltending with losing Markstrom and going with Holtby and Demko. And Holtby the last few years just has not been the same goalie that we saw, you know, from his great years with the Washington Capitals. So, so that team has a lot of things to figure out, but man, the Leafs were just awesome. And then up, you know, up and down the lineup, the big boys are scoring, the depth guys are contributing. Like you said, Freddie has been has been solid. And the thing with Anderson, he he really hasn't had to be great because you know we've talked about this before. His numbers aren't necessarily where you would like them to be, just in terms of his save percentage and goals against. But he hasn't had to be great because. This Leafs offense, it seems, is finally finding its rhythm here. And he just has to be fine. He just doesn't have to go out there and and be a superhuman goaltender like maybe he's had to do at times in the past for this team. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I really, really like what I've been seeing from this team. And, and Laporte, what can you say about Austin Matthews? I mean, he yeah. now has 10 goals in 11 games, leads the <laughs> National Hockey League in goals, He is the best five-on-five goal scorer since the second he stepped into this league. It's not even close. I mean, he's just he's just on another level, man. I mean, we we talk all the time about how great Connor McDavid is. And sure, they do play a different style of game, 
But man, when it comes to putting the puck in the net, this dude is just, I mean, he's, he's the best in the league right now. Yeah, he really is. And the thing about Matthews is that what well, you touched on it, that he scores five on five. And I don't think you can even put into words the value of that. Cause it's all about like the metrics. And again, the word value of like those types of goals and the importance of them. And I'm sure if we pulled out the numbers where, okay, guys who score a lot on the power play, if they were replaced on a very good power play unit, maybe a lesser of a player doesn't score as many goals as that elite player, but they still score often and get a lot of points because they're playing on the power play. Whereas five on five, it it is what it is. You're exposed. So to me, if there's an underrated stat or if there are underrated stats, it's five on five stats. And it it goes back into, into his contract too, because when he got that number, the 11.65 million, we all knew, we all knew deep down that, okay, he's not going to get McDavid's 12 and a half. But then I think what came on the other end of it was Eichel's 10. And we saw that 10 million that Eichel was getting. And we kind of assumed, okay, Austin's going to be in the middle. So we're like, he's going to get the 10.5 or the 11. And I think a lot of Leafs fans, when we saw the 11.65, we kind of thought, hmm, like, (laughs) is that that a little too high? Like, we knew we didn't get hosed on it. But we all kind of thought, maybe that's a little too high. But then you look at those five on five numbers and now you see him coming of age as a player and he is dominating. Like no one is questioning any nickel and dime of that contract now in the way that when he, when he's out there, he's dominant. The guys I compare him to, and I'm not saying he's better than these guys, but the guys I compare him to compare him to are Mario Lemieux and Eric Lindros in the way of number one, he's a center, but number two, the physical gifts he has guys that have that type of size, that type of reach, the kind of talent they have, as well as the hands. So in a sense, like they can physically do it all. He's a rare breed of player. He's a special player. If he has a long career at the Toronto Maple Leafs, he'll, pro- he'll most likely retire as the best Maple Leaf we've ever seen. And again, like we should be lucky to have him. It's one of those things that sometimes we're in the moment and we don't realize how good things are, but Austin Matthews is a once in a lifetime player and he plays for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So those watching, those not watching on YouTube, I'm smiking up with smile right now, but uh, I've, I've pumped the tires of uh, Austin Matthews quite a bit. What do you think, Bruno? (laughs) No, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And you made a really good point about just the size and skill combination. And it's so, so rare because you look at a guy even like like Crosby, right? He's like 5'10", 5'11", and the things he's able to do. Matthews is 6'3", 215, 220, and to see what he's able to do with that size and the hands and the shooting ability and the 200-foot game that I've been so impressed with. Oh, it's got so much better this it's year. It's unbelievable, oh and that's one thing that, that kind of pisses me off when I see people on Twitter – or, you know, just, just hearing from, from other fans and things like that about how, you know, Matthews isn't great in his own end and blah, blah, blah. He still yeah, needs to take another step defensively. But if you've been watching this guy closely, especially over the last couple of years, his ability to just strip guys of the puck when he just goes into corners and he, he lifts the stick, steals the puck, and he's going the other way before you even know it. And I, I don't think he gets enough credit for how good he is defensively and how and how developed his 200 foot game is at this point yeah and just going back to the, to the goal scoring ability i mean it's it's just on another level from anyone in the game right now besides basically ovechkin and, and pasternak i mean mm-hmm. we're, we're truly watching a guy who could go down as one of the top 10 goal scorers in the history of the sport oh yeah that's that's how highly i think of him and and just watching him, never mind on a game-by-game basis, Laporte, a shift-by-shift basis, his ability to just generate offense. And it, I'm not saying he, he goes out there and he's scoring every shift, but he's creating things in the offensive zone almost every single time he's out there where yeah. he has this ability to turn nothing into something. 
Yeah, like you're waiting for it when you're watching him. Like you're kind of sitting up just waiting for like either him to dish it for a shot or for him to shoot it himself. Yeah. Like like there are times where a play is not even there and you're like, oh, okay, they're just going to kind of call it a call it a shift here and get a change. And then Matthews will just strip some of, of the puck, center it into the middle of the ice and they get a scoring chance. Yeah. Or he'll just come out of the corner with the puck and and get a shot on net. Like, I mean, it's just the talent level is off the charts. And it's like you said, we are so lucky that this guy is a member of the Leafs right now. It's 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 unbelievable. But Lapore, speaking of of unbelievable performances, we, we have to hit hit on this one more time. I mentioned it already, but Jason Spezza. Jason Spezza. Oh my goodness. People I mean, who have been to a lot of Suns games can know what reference I'm making. Spezza. As I, I mean, used to say his name on the mic. I, I was taken back to those days where him. Heatley and Alfredson were just ripping it up. Yeah, All the of them putting line. up 90 to 100 points. I mean, Lepore, give me your thoughts on what you've seen so far from a dude that isn't even really getting that much ice time, but is still contributing a heck of a lot on the score sheet. What a guy. Quick note on the uh, Spezza, Heatley, Alfredson line. Back in the day, again, being from Ottawa, when you go to a Sens game, uh, well, that line ended up with the name the Pizza Line because if you went to a Sens game, and if the Sens scored five goals and one, your ticket got you a free slice of pizza at Pizza Pizza. They actually, I think it was a year after the lockout, they had to change it to six because that line, six goals and a win, because that line was just scoring so much. Everybody was getting free pizza every game. And you had Pizza Pizzas turning away people because they were giving away free slices of pizza. But uh, I mean, what can you say about this guy? Here's this guy from the Toronto area who wanted to play for the Toronto Maple Leafs. He got his opportunity. He was great last year, had to deal with all the bullshit with Babs. He could have got deflated. He could have given us the middle middle finger, but no, he didn't. He wanted to come back. Every opportunity he's been given, he's shown that he belongs. And the thing about Spezza, and again, this stuff doesn't get talked about enough. When we talk about the salary cap and today's era of what teams have to do to build teams, Everyone always points to the star players, I find, or like the starting goalie or like the number one defenseman making eight or 10 million. And they'll say, oh, you know, that's a bad deal because so-and-so makes this or this guy makes too much. But at the end of the day, it's about team value. So if you have a star player overpaid by a million, or if you have a third liner or fourth liner overpaid, overpaid by a million, it's the same thing that million dollars is still the same percentage of the cap, whether it goes to the top line guy or the bottom line guy. And I find it doesn't get enough attention when you have a guy on the third or fourth line, say making 3 million. Well, you know, say he's getting paid 2 million too much, but then when when a guy makes 10 million, oh, he should make probably eight. And then he gets shit on and the team gets shit on. It's like, well, overpaying that star player is okay or more acceptable, I should say, in my opinion, because if that's what you have to do to get that star player, you have to do it. Whereas overpaying guys on the bottom end never gets pointed to because it's like, oh yeah, fine, it's that deal is okay. But no, you're still overpaying by a million on the cap and it's the same percentage as the guy who's at the top. And then you see a guy, a guy like Spezza, who, like I said, there's already reason to love him because he wanted to play for us. He's given us everything. It's all been positive. And like, let's talk about value on the cap. If we had to quantify with a number what would be a fair amount to give Jason Spezza, if they were paying him two, three million, would anyone look at us as like, oh, like that's a brutal deal? The Leafs shouldn't have done that. I mean, maybe, but it would be a debate. And then you have him essentially on league men, and he goes out there and scores a hat trick. Like that's value. And and to me, it's like it's another reason to love this guy. Because again, from Toronto, giving it us all, he dealt with a ton of bullshit with Babs. He's taken advantage of every opportunity. He always says the right thing. I'm sure he's a positive influence on the young guys in the locker room. Everyone who's been around Spezza, personally and professionally, absolutely loves him. He's a hell of a pro. And for him to go out and have that performance, it's one of those things that like you can't help but smile to be happy for someone. Like whether, you, whether you're a Leafs fan or not, it's like, you know, Jason Spezza, here's this older guy in a league where these veteran guys are getting kicked to the curb. He's playing for his boyhood team that he cheered for, goes out there and scores a hat trick. Awesome. Awesome. Nothing negative to say at all. It's all positive about Jason Spezza. 
Oh yeah, it's it's incredible, and it's like you said. How can you not root for a guy like this? Yeah, that's the that's the the right way to put it. Yeah, and I even think about uh, last year's playoffs against Columbus, and I forgot what game it was, whether it was game two or three, when he dropped the gloves and fought. And you know, it it was it's a moment like that where you look at Jason Spets and you're like, okay, this guy is 36, 37 years old. He's coming towards the end of his career, he's willing to do anything that it takes to win. It's awesome. Like to see a dude like that who, you know, watching him with the Senators all those years, he was one of the most skilled guys in the league, playing on one of the best lines in the league. You know, he he, he was a top line guy for the majority of his career. Yeah. And then to see him with the Leafs in a playoff series, you know, dropping the gloves and and doing whatever it takes to win and then seeing how he has responded this year at the age of 37 to come out and do the things he's doing. And I talked about this in a previous show where I mentioned how Joe Thornton, right? You know, he's like, what, Thornton's like 41 years old. And he comes onto this team and he's immediately playing 15, 16 minutes a night. And I brought up the point, I'm like, excuse me, but what can't Jason Spezza do better than Joe Thornton? Right. And here's Spezza. He, he doesn't expect anything. He's not complaining. He's playing his 10 to 12 minutes a night. And, and he's going out there and he's contributing. And, and that is exactly what this Leafs team needs. Because, Lepore, we've talked about this so many times. This team is only going to go as far as the big boys take them. We all know that Marner, Matthews, Nylander, and Tavares are the heartbeat of this team. But if you can get some contributions from the bottom six from your third and fourth line, from guys that you are paying less than $1 million per year to. It's crazy. That, that's what unlocks it. That's what turns you from a good team into a great team and even a Stanley Cup favorite. And that's what the Leafs are getting right now with guys like Wayne Simmons and Jason Spezza and Lapore, another guy that we should bring up. Speaking about one of the goals that Spezza scored in, in that hat trick game, just an incredible saucer pass cross ice from Nick Patan. What a pass. And Nick Patan is a guy who was great in the World Juniors for Canada. He's been really good in the American Hockey League, but hasn't been able to land a steady job in the NHL. So, yeah. so what are your thoughts on, on, first of all, Nick Patan and his play on that fourth line? And then, and then why he's he hasn't been able to to find a job in the show. It's weird because Nick Patan's one of those guys that everyone kind of knows because, I mean, in Canada here, we pay so much attention to the, to the World Juniors. He was great at the World Juniors, won a gold medal. He never really got, I think, what I would call a fair shot in Winnipeg. Gets brought to Toronto. If I remember correctly, I think he scored a goal in his first game. Like the first time we called him up, he scored a goal. And here you have this guy, he's put up numbers at every level, maybe not the greatest in the NHL, but in junior hockey, he was an absolute stud. Again, he made the Canadian, uh, the Canadian World Junior Team, and he was an impact player on that team. And then even in the AHL, his time with Manitoba and his time with the Marlies, he's pretty well been a point-of-game player. So it, it's kind of perplexing in the way that, okay, a guy who's a point-of-game player in the AHL, to me, that shows that you're too good for the AHL. I mean, the guy who's an elite player in the AHL should be in the lineup somewhere in the NHL. And even if, if it's not with the Leafs, it's just kind of perplexing how this guy's not been given, I'm not going to say a long-term deal in the NHL, but a real and true shot in the NHL. And I like him. Like, like I, I like him a lot. I mean, it, call, it calls out the depth the Leafs, have, the Leafs have in the organization where you have a guy in the AHL who's, essentially too good for it, but he can't find a permanent spot. But like, like you said, like that pass to Spezza, that's not a normal play. There are guys who have steady jobs in the NHL who can't do that. Now we can go through the Leafs lines and point to guys that we think maybe he's better than, or would fit in a role better than, but I think he deserves at least to be with the Leafs up and down. He, dele he deserves an opportunity to show his worth at the NHL level for longer than a couple of games. But I'd even point to, and I might have raised some eyebrows here, but say Nick Robertson. Okay. As an example, 
here's this kid who we're very excited about was again, like Nick Batan was very good um, for the American team and at the world juniors dominated, dominated the CHL right now today, as we stand, I mean, we can talk about projections and what we think Nick Robertson will be compared to what Nick Batan is today. But right now, as we sit here, is Nick Patan a better player than Robertson? Or even if we're not talking about them directly as players, can he bring more to the table with the Maple Leafs today as a team that's in full win now mode? Like, I think I think it's a good question. And like I just thought of him in the way of a guy who is a good young player who, like, let's face it, he's not going to be put in the top six. So like I really don't think we'll use Robertson like that. So then if you're going to have him in the bottom six, is it better to have Nick Patan in? And again, see what it's worth. And even the way of trade bait, if we put Nick Patan in and he gets some points, this and that, maybe that, that's a nice piece of trade bait, trade bait for the Leafs for a team who's looking for some depth scoring because the guy's skilled. Like, I mean, from what we've seen in, what, like, in the NHL with that pass to Spets, uh, plays like that in the AHL, if he's put with the right guys, he'll put up points. Like, I, don't, I don't think anyone's doubting that. So... Like, again, I'm sure I raised some eyebrows with that one, but what's your take on sort of like a Robertson versus Nick Patan situation? Or if you can think of any, what's another guy in the lineup you can maybe point to and say, I may have Nick Patan in that spot ahead of him. And you bring up a really good point, you know, speaking to that saucer pass that he made to Jason Spezza. That's not a fourth line player. No. Making a play like that. I mean, there's top six forwards who struggle to consistently make plays like that. And, and I think when you look at Patan versus Robertson or whoever, whether you're looking at, you know, Travis Boyd or Pierre Ingvall or any of these guys in the bottom six, you, you first have to look at, okay, what role are they playing, right? And when it comes to right. Nick Robertson, I know he showed flashes in the qualifying round against Columbus. He has an insane shot. But Lapore, it's like you said, are – is Robertson really going to be a top six forward on this team the way that it's constructed right now? Like, is there, is there any reason to rush Nick Robertson into a role like that? Exactly. Considering how young he is. And then when you look at Nick Batan, right? And not like Nick Batan is old, but he's obviously been around a little bit. Um, he's dominated the American Hockey League. And I think the role that you're asking him to play, I think... As of now, you continue to roll with a guy like that yeah. in the bottom six. And and I think there's no reason to to rush playing some of these young guys. And I even think about a guy like Rasmus Sandin, who I've been very impressed with, you know, even watching him in the world juniors with Sweden and you know, having the first round pick pedigree. And and I know that he's going to be a very good player. But the way that the Leafs defense core is constructed right now, it makes a lot of sense. It's like, why are we going to thrust Sandine into the lineup, even though I think he can handle it? But when you have a veteran like Zach Bogosian and you have Travis mm -hmm. Dermott and you have my son, Miko Lettinen, who I'm very <laughs> proud of and love with all my heart. Yes. Yeah, so when I'm you still have waiting guys, for the jersey on the wall, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you have guys like that, Right, it makes a lot of sense as to why a guy like Rasmus Sandin isn't a mainstay in the lineup, and and it's exactly how I think about this this forward core. Right, it's like play these these veteran guys who have proven that that they can contribute offensively in the bottom six. If Nick Robertson isn't quite ready, and I know he's injured at the moment, um, I just think there's really no reason to to rush a guy like that, and and I think you just continue to roll with Nick Patan. Yeah, you mentioned I mean, like, that's a good example with Sandine, and the topic came up here in Ottawa with uh, with Brandstrom. Like, you know, why aren't the Sens playing Brand Brandstrom? This and that, and it was that concern of like rushing him, exposing him, and they compared it to the Sandine situation in Toronto. But I, I disagree with that in the way that no, the Leafs are built to win now, or they're in win now mode for lack of better terminology. Whereas for the Sens, no, throw them in there. I mean, he's not playing anywhere else right now. So I'll throw him in there, get him reps. So again, like Nick Batan, why not? E even talking gen generally about the guy, like I, I really do, I really do hope things work out for him. Like one thing that, that popped into my mind and I'd have to go, I'd have to go over the lists and who's available um, in the expansion draft, but maybe he's the type of player who gets an opportunity with Seattle. Like he's the a guy the Leafs could expose and that's not a bad pickup 
for Seattle, just, you know, putting a lineup and a skilled guy and it's a win-win because Seattle gets a good skilled player and he gets an opportunity to be a full-time national hockey league player. Right. And that's the thing, like worst comes to worst, you continue to play guys like this in the bottom six. And if you do want to make a trade later in the season, you could use a guy like that as trade bait. If Absolutely. you're, you know, confident that when Nick Robertson is healthy and he comes back, that he's ready to be thrust into, you know, a second or third line role, right? So, so yeah, the Leafs, the thing with the Leafs right now is that their depth is looking really good. They have a lot of options. It's a good problem to have. Yeah. You have a lot of players like this who can play different roles. And, and I love how Sheldon Keefe is giving everyone an opportunity in that bottom six to show that they can contribute and help this team as they, as they go along. Speaking of that, Bruno, I, I wanted to get your opinion on something because you mentioned like the bottom six and guys getting moved around. Something that popped in my head, and like I really want to get your opinion on this, is is that an underrated benefit right now based on the scheduling format? Because kind of like how I mentioned about the Canucks games, like you play them the first time, you absolutely obliterate them. You have to play them again, and you're afraid of that letdown. But being able to put new, and I have to go through every game, see who the Leafs took, took in and out but is having that ability to switch guys over between games is that a huge benefit in the way that you've guys going in they're motivated as opposed to like that guy who's playing on the third or fourth line who you know okay we kicked the crap out of the Canucks last night we're playing them again that thing in the back of your mind that they're going to roll over again but no when a new guy goes in there he's motivated to play number one and he's motivated for his opportunity so I think maybe maybe it's not getting enough attention I think in like kind of what the NHL is right now I think it's a huge advantage, especially when you look at how the Leafs are constructed, right? There's not many teams who, with their top six, it's essentially set in stone with the two main pairs on both lines, right? How you have Matthews and Marner, Tavares and Nylander. So if you're one of these depth guys on the Leafs, you know game in and game out, okay, maybe you're going to get a chance to play on the wing with one of these guys, but probably yeah. not, right? Because you know, Zach Hyman is, is going to be the guy who's, whether he's shifting from the first or second line, whatever, right? He can play with with anyone in that top six. So if you're one of these guys like Patan, Spezza, and even, you know, Wayne Simmons, Jimmy VC, and Travis Boyd and Pierre Engvall, you, you know that you're going to be expected to contribute in that bottom six. Yep. And you're going out there, and, and I think the pressure's off them a little bit. And listen, there is pressure because they want to keep their jobs and they want to prove to Sheldon Keith that they deserve to be in the lineup game in and game out. But I think the pressure's taken off in the sense that they, they know that they don't have to come in and, and light the world on fire. Mm -hmm. They know that the Leafs' top six is one of the best in the NHL. Those guys are all going to score – just come in and be and be a spark plug yeah. in the bottom six. And, and I think it really helps the Leafs to have that depth where, like you said, they stay motivated. Guys like that are staying motivated because, you know, they might come out of the lineup for a game or two and they're like, shit, I really got to prove that I, you know, <laughs> I, I should stay in the lineup for the next two or three games. Yeah, and You get performances like that, right, from a guy like Nick Batan and even from, from Travis Boyd. Yeah, Ooh, and we don't have Robertson and, or Thornton right now, man. Exactly. So you, there, there's two more guys that. you're gonna add, man. You better you better fucking show up when you get your opportunity, or you're gonna you're gonna get axed in a hurry. Yeah, big time. So so I totally agree with you there. I think that's a very underrated advantage to have at the moment, which a lot of teams, especially in the Canadian division, absolutely do not have right now. And Lapore, one other thing I wanted to hit on is this Leafs power play, yeah. which has just been ridiculous. Yeah. They're clicking at 38.5%. And I'll oh, be it's the gone, first... It's gone down then. It was like in the mid-40s. <laughs> mid-40s at yeah, one it's, point. Yeah, it's gone down a click or two. Yeah. Still just absolutely outrageous, the, the rate they're, they're operating at. But I'll be the first to admit that, you know, when we first started this podcast... I came on here and I said, what the hell are the Leafs doing not loading up that top power play unit? We've seen it work in the past, especially last year. They were the number two power play under Sheldon Keefe. They loaded the top unit with all their big guys. And this year, with Manny Maholtra running the power play, they are staggering the units. You know, we see Wayne Simmons as the net front presence on the first unit. Tavares so and Nylander on the second unit. And Laporte, it doesn't seem to matter 
both of these power play units are contributing right now. And it's incredible to see. And this is a huge, huge weapon for the Leafs moving forward. Yeah, it's it's kind of not fair how good their power play has been. I know, I think it was at some point during during the first Canucks game, I think the rate for the season was 44%. And if I remember, Gord Miller said that it was the best ever after at any, what did I think you say after 10 games or no team had ever been that high after 10 games. And you just watch it, man. Like they're snapping it around, doing whatever the hell they want with the puck. It's almost as if like, it's arrogant. Like, 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 like I'll, I'll say it, man. Like, like, especially when Matthews and Marner are out there, it's like you're at pickup hockey and there's two guys who are too good and they're just kind of doing whatever they want between themselves and they'll let other guys have it here and there when they want, just so they can feel good about it. But it's, it's, it's a serious weapon right now, as you mentioned, it's to the point now where I said it last night, watching the game, it feels weird when they don't score. Cause like, again, like both in the way of, okay, they didn't score on that power play as well as because they're moving it around so much and getting so many shots, the goalie is flipping on his head. It's, it's odd when you, wow, we didn't, we didn't score on that one. Hmm. And then you look at the metrics after and it's like, oh, we created three scoring chances. Just one didn't go in, but yeah, I mean like over the course of the season, I mean, we'll probably see it adjust to something that's more of a more, more of a normality, but as of now, like let's ride the wave and who knows, maybe it doesn't, maybe this is going to turn something in the NHL where you see a power play that can eclipse something in the way of 30% go maybe one out of three. I mean, like the thing with the power play, people talk about a good power play and a bad power play. The basic number, like average power play in the NHL is usually around 20%. And then if you look, an elite power play is like 25. And then a bad power play is 15. So like the gap between an average power play and a bad power play is only 5%. So that's one in 20. Uh, out of every 20 power plays, you score one, you score one fewer and then going the other way, you score one more. So like the gaps within power plays aren't that great, but we're seeing something completely different now in the way that it's essentially a coin flip if the Toronto Maple Leafs are going to score on the power play. Yeah. This is almost like watching like team Canada at the world juniors on the power play yeah, against Kazakhstan or something. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's getting to that point. Like when you're clicking at nearly 40%, I mean, that is just, that that's next level production right there. And, and when I think about like some of the great power plays that you see around the NHL, whether it's, you know, Washington with Ovechkin or the Oilers power plays with McDavid and dry or even Pittsburgh with Crosby and Malkin. Yeah. Boston. When you think about a lot of these teams around the league, what they've done recently. And when I say recently, you know, over the last few years, let's say is they're keeping all their studs on the power play for almost as long as possible. Like when you think about Alex Ovechkin, yeah, he just chills out there. He's out there for the full two minutes. They know that it's, you know, he's obviously one of the greatest goal scorers in the history of the sport. That's arguably one of the top three weapons in the league to have that shot on the power play. It, or even when you look at Edmonton with McDavid and Dreisaitl, and, and I believe in, in their Saturday, Saturday night game against the Flames, I saw a stat on Twitter that they stayed on for the final five minutes and 45 seconds of the game. Yeah, I saw that. Like yeah, that is, and, and, and it's just, it's just insane. So when you think about that and, and how all these teams have been utilizing their stars and they're keeping them on the power play as long as possible, you know, giving them heavy minutes. And then you look at the Leafs, they don't have to do that. And they're still dominating. Like, it doesn't matter which unit is out there. And and I think as they progress through the season and you get into the playoffs, it is such an advantage because if one unit isn't clicking, you throw out that second unit. I mean, to have guys like John Tavares and William Nylander on your second power play unit, I mean, that is, that's just unbelievable. So I love what Manny Maholtra has been doing. And again, I'll admit it. I, I doubted it at first. Hmm. I didn't think it made a lot of sense. You know, I, I, I said, don't galaxy brain the situation. Just load it up with your top five guys and have Morgan Riley on the point and, and call it a day. But to see the way that this team is scoring on the power play almost at will is, is unbelievable. And I cannot wait to see how this progresses throughout the season. Is there, any, is there anything that jumps out to you, say, compared to last year? either in the way of personnel or execution that 
is the kind of like the launching pad as to why this is happening. Well, I look back to last year and I almost felt like the Leafs were forcing Tyson Berry to get comfortable on that top unit. Okay. And then another thing, how they weren't really flexible in terms of how they moved Matthews and Marner around, how it just seemed like last season they were on the same spot, you know, basically every time they were on the power play. Whereas this season, you know, you'll see them come out once where, where Matthews is on his strong side and then the next power play, he's on his weak side. And, and they just try to give you different looks. And then I've been so impressed with Wayne Simmons. Incredible. Yeah. I, I, that's the one I was going to say. Yeah, like just his Simmons presence in front, of in front of the net, just to create screens and some of the tips that he's made so far this year. Yeah, just I be mean, a dick. he's just been super impressive. And obviously we can talk about the physicality and the toughness and the grit that everyone likes to talk about. He's brought all that to the table as well. But to see how comfortable he's fit in with that top power play has been very nice to see. So what do you think is, has kind of been the, the big difference this year on the power I, play? I, I was actually going to point to Simmons. Like, I, I think that maybe the difference is this year beyond like progression of the star players that it seems that we have someone in front of the net all the time who's actually supposed to be there. Like I'm not the biggest fan. Like when they put, we put Tavares in front of the net, it's like, no, he's a skilled player. Like, like put him on the outside. Like who am I to say who should be wearing a power play, but I like to see the high men call me old school. I like to see the high men. I like to see the Simmons and to put your skill on the outside, use Riley, your boy Lettinen has shown him the power play that he can distribute the puck. He can shoot the puck. It's, it's a lot of weapons and a lot of looks coming, coming from different places. But the thing I was going to point to specifically in the way of a big key difference was Simmons having that. Because again, you, you, for, you force the other team to think about it too, right? Because they think, okay, we got to put so-and-so out there to deal with Simmons and maybe the Leafs don't put Simmons out there. And then that maybe that takes away from your second penalty kill unit. And then like you said, you, now you're dealing with Tavares and Nylander with guys who you want, don't want dealing with Tavares and Nylander. So it's layered, but yeah, Simmons was going to be the one that I circled. Yeah, no, he, he's been fantastic. He's almost kind of given me JVR vibes. You know, it's funny. It's funny. Mitch, Cause I said someone the other day, I'm like, fuck man, like JVR, like is that JVR? I always really appreciated him because he was a kind of a different type of player than what we had. And it kind of popped in my head the other day. Like, yeah, JVR would be really nice. Like, like on this team and he's doing really well in Philadelphia this year but uh i guess we we filled that void with simmons but earlier on i was like yeah man we could really use jvr oh yeah big time and and simmons has exceeded all expectations so far and again we're, we're gonna see if he can keep this up as the season goes along but so far it has been a fantastic signing for the leafs uh lapore switching gears now a little bit uh to the team that the leafs absolutely demolished this week the vancouver oh. canucks coming into the season I actually kind of like the Canucks. And listen, I know everyone was talking about this on Twitter and how Jim Benning screwed up their depth and their bottom six is overpaid. And, yeah. you know, they had to let Tyler to fully walk because they couldn't afford him. Shit. Saying all that. <laughs> and like, yeah, it, it sounds terrible. But then when you look at their top six forwards, they still have a lot of talent in that top six. They have yeah. Quinn Hughes on the back end, who right now is leading all defensemen in scoring in the NHL. Yeah. Um, the, the one area where I was not sold on this Canucks team was their goaltending, because I thought losing Jacob Markstrom was going to be a big problem. And so far... It has been a problem, but you can probably look more to the team defense and the defense core for a lot of the issues this team has had. But Lapore, I mentioned this off the top of the show. This team has been outscored 23 to nine in four straight losses to the top two teams in the Canadian division, the Habs and the Leafs. So, so what are your thoughts on this Canucks team? Like, are the Leafs just that good or are the Canucks in deep, deep trouble here? To answer that question specifically, they got to get out of this like defensive funk because it could be a slippery slope right now. And the way the division is playing out, I mean, we all see Toronto and Montreal near the top and then that kind of cluster of teams fighting for three and four, maybe after Winnipeg, like Winnipeg's looking pretty good. But if they don't figure this out, I mean, they're going to fall behind in a hurry. Uh, looking at their record, you can take away three wins from the Senators. So like if you evaluate whatever they're six and nine, 
Yeah. Something like this. So you take away three wins. And I'm, I mean, everyone's going to play the Sens, but people know what I'm referring to in the way that, yeah, you're three and nine against teams does not name the Ottawa Senators. So not looking good. Just look at the back end. I mean, like, like no, nothing jumps out as like bad, but it's okay. Like Alex Edler, like, like what is he at this point in his career? Tyler Myers, one of those guys who like never really ended up being what we hoped he would be from his early signs in the NHL. Jordy Ben's Jordy Ben. You mentioned Quinn Hughes is an absolute stud, but it looks bad. Like I, 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 it's like all that stuff. When the Leafs looked as good as they looked in the last two games, it's a combination of, yeah, the Leafs are really good offensively and this team is not very good defensively, but the body language was not good. And it's, it's, it's hard to have, good body language when you're getting beaten up on but that team looked beat and even again like that's as i mentioned earlier i expected the leafs to kind of have a tough one in that second game and like the canucks it didn't even seem like they put up a fight man like you always expect that team to to kind of rally around a loss and jump on their opponent because their opponent maybe takes them too lightly but nope it just if anything that game last night was easier than the first game and again look at the goalies like speaking of body language, like that's a that that's a meme that's going around. Like Holpe's face, like after Matthew's goal, and even like Demko just with like his head down in his shoulder pads, and like like Travis Green seems like a really good guy. He seems like uh, the type of coach that players would really love playing for. And we're never in the locker room. We just kind of get these gauges off what we see people say in the media and their quick snippets and in interviews. But he's going to have to show it because he's got to motivate these guys because right now they do not look motivated. And I think the biggest thing you hit on it briefly was how, okay, I'll give the Canucks the benefit of the doubt playing their third game in four nights in the first game of the week against the Leafs. They lost 7-3, throw that out the window. So you say, okay, this team can't possibly be this bad. Yeah. And then they come out again on Saturday night and just get run over again. And yeah, like you said, just to see Braden Holpe absolutely stunned, rattled, whatever you want to call it, just the body language of some of the players on the Canucks, it doesn't look good right now. And and I think this team getting beat like that two games in a row against the Leafs and really four games in a row if you include the Montreal Canadiens games as well, I think that team has come to the realization but they're just not in the same class. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. They, they showed one, one like screenshot of the bench. And I thought that to myself of like the looks on the guy's face is kind of that, that look of defeat in the way of like, these guys are just too good for what we are right now. No, that's, that's what it looked like. And you can look at like Louis Erickson and how they're paying him 6 million and Antoine Roussel, 3 million, Jay Beagle, 3 million, like, yeah, there are some bad contracts on this team, and the bottom six is not good. And when you stack it up against the bottom six of the Leafs or the Habs, it's pretty ugly. Yeah. But I would like to think that with the talent that this team has, when you just think about down the middle, when you have Elias Pettersson and Bo Horvat and Brock Besser and JT Miller on the wings and this team is this team is very talented and Quinn Hughes, like we talked about. This team has the talent. And I think when you just think about this Canadian division in general, like, okay, the Senators are done. They're they're a mess. The Oilers, besides McDavid and Drysidle, depth-wise, are are kind of a disaster as well, especially defensively. Mm-hmm. Um, this Canucks team, I still think, based on the talent that they do have on paper should still be in the mix to make the playoffs in this division. Yeah. And, and I think this is something we got to talk about as well, Lepore, is like, you know, we came into the season thinking that the Canadian division was going to be competitive and, you know, there'd be some high-scoring games, obviously, with talent like Matthews and McDavid and Dreisaitl and go down the list, right? But so far, it's looking like you got the Leafs and Habs as the class of the division. You have the Jets, who have been solid, and then it's just kind of been ugly, pile of shit yeah so what are your thoughts lapore yeah as you mentioned we went into this season thinking that and i think based on two based on points percentages of last year it seemed like there were a lot of good teams and we were going to have like really good battles in the standings but 
I don't know, man. Like you forget too. Like I was thinking about it and you have Winnipeg, Calgary and Vancouver. Well, last year, like they got to beat up on the California teams a lot. So do we think they were better than, than they really are? And then as a matter of just like, like, fuck, let's say it, it's Canadian media. So we pump these teams and specifically, specifically these players more than they deserve to be pumped, but it looks bad. Like, like I think really, if I'm being completely objective, this is not a good division. Because again, like the, the Leafs and Habs are winning a lot of games. You mentioned Winnipeg looking good, but like these last two games against the Canucks, like that's a bad team. Like we've kind of acknowledged, uh, take away the Knights when Drysaddle and McDavid carry the Oilers. They're a bad team. Right now, the Ottawa Senators are a bad team. So it's not even like you're getting respond good responses from teams or like even kind of say like Vancouver last night. It's a hell of an eye opener to how important Markstrom was to that team. So, okay. Like say last season, you're playing against the Canucks, but you have to deal with Markstrom. Like, so anything can happen. We don't know. I mean, he could make 50 saves and you end up losing a game that you should have won. Whereas now they don't even have that. So it's a rough one, man. And like, maybe we can do it on our next show. Like look at the divisions, have like a, a division battle Royale and create rankings of the divisions. Cause it's tough to measure with the same teams playing each other over and over again. But just looking from what I've seen so far, this is not good. Like the, the, this, this is not a good division. And it's going to be interesting to see how the, three that have kind of cemented themselves as the go-to playoff teams stay motivated throughout the season. Again, like not only being so comfortable, but also playing the same teams over and over again that, you know, you're superior then. So we'll see. I mean, hopefully these guys get motivated by their stats and <laughs> look as it as a, as ammunition, ammunition for the next payday. But all in all, the, the division is not good. The, the division is not good. I don't care to anyone in the can, Canadian media is going to push at us. It's a, there are a lot of bad teams in this division. So like, yeah, what's your take and, and on it? And that's the thing. And, and you could say, Oh, it's early. It's only been, you know, 15 no. games or whatever, but no, it, it's, it's not. Early. <laughs> it, it's just not, there's 56 games here. We yeah. now have clear evidence that there are three to four, just bad teams in this division. And that's why I don't even really think you can get a clear gauge on even how good the Leafs and the Habs are. Yeah. You know, as as much as we've been pumping their tires, you don't really know until you play some of these other elite teams. And you think about, you know, like Colorado or Vegas or even the way the Dallas Stars have been playing, right? So it's going to be really interesting when teams actually get out of their division and get to the, the conference finals. It's going to be the conference finals before you face anyone else. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, there could be a team that just gets completely shell-shocked and who knows, maybe it could be a team in this Canadian division where, you know, you're beating up on the Senators and Canucks all year. And then all of a sudden you're playing Tampa and you're like, oh my God, what the hell just hit me? But yeah, um, that's going to be, it's going to be very, very cool to see how that, how that transpires down the road here. But Lepore next week for the Leafs. Yeah. It's a big week because they play the Canucks again, but then they also have two games against the Montreal Canadiens. So let's go. <laughs> we know where this is headed. Yeah. And again, it's not early. We know it's going to be the Leafs and Habs battling for this division over the, you know, last 40 games of the season. So, Laporte, what are your thoughts on this this Montreal Canadiens team right now because they're good. They're 8-2 two and 2. Um, but are they as good as people think they are? And I don't want to be the guy that comes out here and shits on the Montreal Canadiens because They've proved me wrong. They are better than I thought they were going to be this season. But I just look at their team, and I see Jeff Petrie leading the team in scoring. And I like Jeff Petrie. He's a good defenseman. But really, I mean, is, is something like that sustainable? Tyler Toffoli has one 30-goal season in his career, and I know he's off to a great start. But when you look at the Leafs, for example, and you see Matthews, Marner, Tavares, and Nylander are the top four scorers, and – you know, they're getting secondary scoring and everyone's playing well. I don't know. Are, are, are you sold on the Montreal Canadiens? Do you, do you think they're as legit as their record indicates right now? I mean, what are they? They're what, 8-2-2? Two and two? 
I mean, are they as legit as their record indicates? I mean, we can debate that one all day long. I think they're a very good team. I think the Montreal Canadiens are one of those teams. I mentioned about them on an earlier show. They can beat you a lot of ways because they do have the guys who can score. They can beat you with goaltending. We all know that. We've agreed that Julian's a good coach. The thing that jumps out at me at Montreal is that if we look at the two lineups of the Habs and Leafs, I think it's easy to say the Maple Leafs have a superior lineup, like in the way of depth and talent. But there is that thing in me, and maybe it's just being the Maple Leafs fan in the way of my insecurities or being a Maple Leafs fan in how I look at the Montreal Canadiens. But I'll say it, like there is that thing that scares me about a playoff matchup in the way that, again, like like I said, I, I think, or I would call anyone wrong who said the Montreal Canadiens had a superior lineup, more talent, more depth. But that whole phrase of who's better built for the playoffs, if someone told me Montreal was better built for the playoffs, I wouldn't say I would totally agree with them, but I would be open to hearing that. I definitely would. And maybe because it's Carey Price or we can talk about a, a more of a balanced lineup, a more experienced coach, a more, a more experienced coach. But I believe in Montreal right now. I mean, I think people are getting ahead of themselves saying that this is the team to circle as a team that can win the Stanley Cup. But they're going to get through the season. Like we just finished talking about how weak this division is. So they're going to get through this season uh, with a very good record because they're going to play a lot of weak teams like the Leafs are. I'd be shocked if Winnipeg catches either. I shouldn't say I would be shocked if Winnipeg catches. Yeah, no, I would be shocked if Winnipeg catches Montreal or Toronto. So you're going to have a likely scenario where you have the um, Montreal, Montreal playing a team they should beat in the first round. And then they end up, let's say it hopefully against the Leafs in the second round. And then they're in the conference finals. So I, I don't really think they will get exposed if they are to be exposed or if they deserve to be exposed, because again, they're going to play a bunch of bad teams and the playoffs will line up how they line up. But to sum it all up broadly, I mean, it's kind of funny because we, we looked at what they did in the off season and okay. You we've talked about Anderson. We've talked about Suzuki. We talked about to This was a team that was not very good last year. But that's pretty three pretty big pieces. And, and everyone knows in the cap era, the gap between being bad and average isn't that big. And the gap between being average and good is not that big. So if you bring in three impact players, I mean, Suzuki has developed well to fully scoring and Anderson has done, has done very well. So if you just add three pieces like that, it makes a huge difference. It's kind of like how we mentioned with the Leafs. Kind of like it just removing Cody CC. If you remove Cody CC and you add TJ Brody, like on the surface, it doesn't look like this huge deal. Like, oh, you went out and you got Pietrangelo or whatever. But that makes you better. So if you have three of those, that's impactful. And the, 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 that's how I look at the Canadians. Again, I, I pumped the tires of, uh, of Bergevin in another show. And I, I look at those three things that have come into the Montreal Canadiens. So if, if I believe in them, if I believe they are, for lack of better words, the real deal, I do. I think they can make a run. I don't think they have what it takes to win the whole thing. But that's a good team. That's a hell of a good team. And we saw in 1986 and we saw in 1993 when they won the Cup. Both those years, they were not the best team. They weren't even close to the best team. And Montreal was able to do it. So we've had a, a hell of a run with a, with a crazy virus and a weird NHL setup. So maybe I'll be wrong. So. Let, yeah. Let's hear more with the Habs, Bruno. I know you've been dying to rip on the Habs. You're praying for a losing streak, eh? Just to get proven right everywhere. And you're going to go nuts on Twitter, pointing everyone saying you were right. So I, I cannot wait for next week because I'm on the record – I, I think the Leafs are the best team in the division. I think they're a better team than the Montreal Canadiens. I don't care what the Habs have done so far. <laughs> I'm still not sold on them. And Habs fans, you can come, you know, rip on me, come chirp me. I don't care. Comment rip. down below, as I always say. Exactly. Comment down below. Give me everything you got. But when I look at this team, and yes, I, I think they're clearly a playoff team. And I, I like the depth that they have. And I think their defense core is really good. 
But again, going to the, you know, just kind of looking at the the score sheet and I see Jeff Petrie leading the team in scoring. I actually looked this up last night. Okay. The last time a Montreal Canadiens defenseman led the team in scoring over a full season. Can I was guess? Sprague oh. Cleghorn <laughs> in 1922. Okay. Okay. So, and I'm pretty sure that is accurate. I, I, I checked this. I went through all the seasons. I couldn't believe it. And I, you know, they've had years where Sheldon Surrey had it. That, that was going to be my guess. I was going to Sheldon Surrey pull when I mean, leading the team in scoring is all crazy, but he had some good years. I got him a big contract. Yeah. Sheldon Surrey's had some good years, even PK Subban before he got traded. Right, right. But uh, yeah. And, and I just look at this team and, you know, even seeing like Tyler Toffoli, you know, being right behind Matthews in the goal scoring race. I, I just, I, I want to see this team play the Leafs again because we saw that first game. The Habs got out to a flying start. The Leafs obviously came back and beat them in overtime. I, I want to see now that we're four weeks into the season how these teams are going to play because now they've gotten comfortable. They've established themselves as the top two teams. And, and again, I'm just not sold on the high-end talent of the Montreal Canadiens because I don't think they have it outside of Nick Suzuki, who I think one day is going to be one of the best centers in the Eastern Conference. He's not quite there yet. And as good as Tyler Toffoli's been playing, like I mentioned, Lapore, he's had one 30-goal season in his career. Mm-hmm. And Josh Anderson, I really like what he's brought to the table so far. He's almost brought that same element that the Leafs have in Wayne Simmons. Now, I think Josh Anderson is a better player than Wayne Simmons, obviously. But... He's brought that dimension where he's he's a physical guy. He's scoring goals. He's adding to the depth of that lineup. Um, but but again, I, I just I'm not quite sold on the ceiling of the Montreal Canadiens. And I think that yes, they will be a problem for anyone in a playoff series because of their team defense and their defense core and their goaltending. But Lapore, speaking of goaltending, real quick, yeah. Carey Price has not been good this year. Jake Allen has a let me let me just look at the numbers real quick. Jake Allen 4 and 1 with a 940 save percentage and a 1.81 goals against. Boom. Carey Price 4 1 and 2 with an 899 save percentage yep. and a 2.81 goals against. Should should we be well, should we? Should Montreal Canadiens fans be concerned with the play of Carey Price so far? I feel like that question has never been asked to Montreal Canadiens fans in the past. Should you be worried about the play of Carey Price? They're like, we've heard this before, guys. We've heard this before. But the Carey Price one is an interesting one, man. Like, should they be worried about it? No, they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be worried about it because Carey Price has been around long enough and he's proved to us that he is what he is, and then he's an elite goalie, and when it matters, he's going to play his best. And how I talk about, I talked about the format earlier and the way that Montreal is going to find themselves uh, in the playoffs. So be my guest, be my guest betting against Carey Price. But I more look at it broadly, okay? Like I look at it in the way of, are the Montreal Canadiens, or would the Montreal Canadiens be a better team if they did not have Carey Price, now everyone just freaked out. <laughs> I, I can hear, I can hear them Uh-oh. in Montreal freaking out. Uh oh, Bing, Bing, Bing. But when I say that, I'm saying from more of a contract standpoint. There are great players all over the National Hockey League, and we're to the point now where we don't even measure players based on their performance. And it, it, let's call a spade a spade. Trades aren't even made based on performance now they're they're made based on cap situations i've I've had the conversation with a friend of mine even saying like when we were kids in the pre-cap era we would talk about the great players and say you know insert all-star here would you want him on your team it's like of course you would of course you'd want brendan shanahan or matt sundin or mario lemieux or eric lindros wayne gretzky of course you would want them on your team we're to the point now where you can circle star players. You can circle maybe even the best player in a position and say, I wouldn't want that guy because he makes too much. That, that's the world we live in right now. It's about value. And you look at the Montreal Canadiens, and this is a compliment to the Montreal Canadiens. Here's a team that has started the season 8-2-2. Two, and two, One of the best teams in the NHL with a great coach, looking good, deep team, like we've said, they seem to be very, very well built for a solid season and a team that's 
looks to be very well built for the playoffs. But let's look at the cap situation. They have price at 10 and a half million. Okay. You pointed to Allen's numbers. I put them here in front of me too. Allen's 4 1 0, 9 4 0 save percentage. Okay. Now, I'm in no way saying that Jake Allen is better than Carey Price. Of course not. But let's say we removed Carey Price from the situation in Montreal. That would free up 10 and a half million. Let's add a quality backup to Jake Allen at 1.5 million. So Jake Allen makes just under four and a half million. We'll just call it four and a half million. And then we'll give that back up 1.5 million. As I said, now you're paying your goalies 6 million instead of 15 million that you are currently. So the, I'm not, again, I'm not sitting here saying that the Montreal Canadians are in a situation where Jake Allen is superior to Carey Price and they'll, they'll win games without Carey Price and Jake Allen between the pipes. What I am asking Montreal Canadiens fans is would the Montreal Canadiens be better off not having Carey Price freeing up $9 million in cap space and allocating that $9 million somewhere else? Because as we've touched on, and I don't think anyone, even the biggest Canadiens fan or homer would say, this team's got the best high-end talent on forward and defense. No, they're a well-balanced lineup that's winning games and they look really fucking good. But would that $9 million be something that they could use to put them over the top? Could they add three good players? Could they add two very good players? Could they add one elite player at center or D that would put them at a point where they are universally recognized as a contender? And again, having good goaltending still available to them in the way of Jake Allen and a quality backup. I remember when, when Carey Price signed that deal, even at the time, like, like 10.5 million jumped out at people. And the number at the times, they, they looked at Price's save percentage and they compared it. And it, it even may have went beyond what his save percentage was. It may have been like sort of like his overall goalie measures. And they compared it to what the average goalie in the league was. And the average goalie in the league for that season was Ben Bishop. And if you looked at the overall metrics of rating a goalie and then you compared Carey Price and Ben Bishop I think the gap in an 82 game season was like 12 goals so paying Carey Price what you pay him versus paying the average goalie what you pay the average goalie was 12 goals and again that, that, I remember they, them even making the point that's over 82 games and your goalie doesn't play 82 games so then do the math on what that extra money is worth. And then you can come back and say, okay, but what matters is the playoffs and being game seven and overtime, you want carry price. That's a whole other discussion, but it's just in the way of value. And then it causes the greater discussion of how much should you pay your goalie? And, and I think it's kind of the example I've given to people talking broadly about sports is that to me, the goalie has kind of become what the running back has become in the NFL in the way that sure you really want one, that's really good and, you know, gets you those yards and he's a star, but you're not going to pay him star money because the gap between a really good running back and an average running back is not that great. And when you can pay an average running back far less to get him and, and allocate that money in your offensive line or whatever, it's better for your team. And I think that's where we're at in the NHL. So it's kind of a more broad topic in the way of what does a, a, a goalie deserve, but Canadians fans, like, like I'd love, and again, comment down below about what you think about the current situation with the Montreal Canadiens. This is a very good team. Would you be able to get to that next level, not having Carey Price and spreading that $9 million somewhere else? No, Lepore, you, you bring up a very intriguing conversation because I look at a guy like Sergei Bobrovsky on the <laughs> Panthers, and yeah, they're paying no. this guy $10 million a year. And the backup, Chris Drieger, is outplaying him again this season. So yeah. everyone knew that deal was bad as soon as he signed it's, it. It's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, you got you got goalies just coming up out of nowhere all over the league. Even look at Jonas Corposalo and Elvis Mers Lincolns on Columbus, right? Yeah. I think one of the worst things you could do is allocate a big portion of your salary cap to a goaltender. And it's just because of the volatility of the position. Sure. If you've got a really good star forward or defenseman, by all means, if you want to pay them 
go ahead. But when it comes to goaltending, it's one of those positions that year after year, we see the volatility where we see a guy who, you know, could have a 920, 930 save percentage. And then the very next season fall off the face of the earth out of nowhere. Yeah. And we've seen that with guys like Bobrovsky. We've even seen that with Carey Price. We've seen that with Jonathan Quick. We've seen, oh, we yeah. even saw that last year with, with John Gibson, who, you know, put a string of three to four good seasons together. And then last year, he just wasn't very good. And I'm sure there's plenty of other examples out there. But when you look at that contract that Carey Price has at 10.5 a year, and you just think about their lack of, of star talent in the lineup and what they could spend that money on, it really, really intrigues me. Um, just thinking about what that team could look like if they weren't paying Carey Price that much money. And again, we both know how good Carey Price is. Yeah, he's the best in the world. Yeah, he's fantastic. And of course, I'd want him in a seven-game playoff series. I would take him over every goalie in the Canadian division, essentially, um, in a seven-game playoff series. But, but yeah, I mean, you cannot be allocating that percentage of your salary cap to a goaltender who's getting outplayed by his backup. And it's as simple as that. So, so yeah, Montreal Canadiens fans, we would love to hear from you. And we know you will. <laughs> below. Please let us know what you think about the current situation with the Habs and with Carey Price or whatever else you want to talk about. But, Lepore, before we wrap this thing up, um, any closing thoughts here about the Leafs and what you're excited um, looking towards the next week of the season against the, uh, the Canucks and the Habs? It's, it's going to be fun because we we talked about the Canucks and we mentioned how we expected to see a really good effort from them last night and we didn't get it. And this is more broadly about the Canucks. And I mentioned Travis Green trying to motivate these guys. Do you want to get embarrassed three games in a row? I'm sure they don't. And I'm sure Travis Green doesn't want to have his team get embarrassed three night, three games in a row. So I'm expecting a game from the Canucks at least. And then we go into the Montreal games where we will see Twitter explode and we'll see some games where people will overanalyze, overevaluate, make assessments on and crown a Canadian division champion based on the results with uh, it'll be like 35 plus games to go. We're almost 40 games to go in the, uh, or well, yeah, it will still be 40 some odd games to go in the season. So it'll be fun. Montreal versus Toronto is always fun. It's too bad. We've had to have this much of a gap in between but uh i'm excited super bowl sunday and then uh a great week ahead of hockey what are your thoughts bruno on the upcoming games against vancouver yeah, no, and montreal it, it should be awesome and and again i i really want to see what the canucks do and how they respond after getting beat two games in a row like that and then i i think you nailed it with you know that twitter is oh. going to crown the canadian division champion next week it's going to be that first game whoever wins leafs habs Twitter's going to go ballistic. And yeah. can you imagine if one of the teams actually win in a blowout oh. or, you know, even if it's like a four, one or, you know, five, two sort of game, it's just going to create an absolute shit storm on Twitter. And yeah. I can't wait for it. Laporte. It's the best. It, it's going to be incredible. <laughs> so yes, next week, the Leafs got the Canucks and the Habs twice. So it should be awesome. And that is going to do it. For this episode of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, thank you so much for listening. Whether you're listening on Apple or Spotify or Google, please go on there, give us a five-star rating, and write us a, a nice review while you're at it as well. We would really appreciate that. And for those watching on YouTube, like we've been saying throughout the podcast, please leave your comments below. We love continuing the conversation on there. And if you haven't done so already, Smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you can get notified every single time we drop new content. So for Michael Lepore, I'm Anthony Bruno. We will see you guys in the next episode. Oh.